Hello all, thank you for joining us. Again, we continue our Bible study series um, and uh, we are looking at the different resurrection stories of Jesus in this week um, after Easter. Uh, the last session did the resurrection stories um, in the Gospel of Matthew, a couple of them. Uh, today we're going to turn our attention to the Gospel of Mark. Um, the Gospel of Mark happens to be my favorite, uh, fascinating um, gospel, I think. And so uh, we're going to jump into that today. Mark will take two days, um, so two different sessions on the Gospel of Mark. But first I want to pray for us. First, though, you want to grab a Bible, grab something to write with, grab something to write on. There are no particular handouts or anything for this um, study. Um, you just want to definitely have your Bible in front of you. So grab that. We're going to, uh, let, me, let me lead us in prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day, Lord, as we turn our attention to the Gospel of Mark and uh, what uh, the ways in which this Gospel communicates to us the meaning and, and purpose and relevance of Christ's resurrection in our lives. We give you thanks, O oh God, and be with us, bind us together as we cannot be physically together, but spiritually we are bound by your word, and we give thanks for that. Bless this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so I said that um, uh, the Gospel of Mark is my favorite. It's fascinating. So uh, let me just uh, sort of lay the groundwork uh, a little bit here. The Gospel of Mark is a good study um, for how Scripture is developed, um, how the Bible came to be. Of course, we do not believe that a giant hand came out of heaven and, and wrote the, the Bible down. We do not believe that... Um, God, uh, the, the disciples or anyone else was sort of following Jesus around and, and writing down. Um, we don't believe that God dictated the words of the Bible um, into the ears of someone. Rather, what we believe is that there were people who were called by God and lifted up and chosen by their community to be the people who would write um, the story of God and the stories of, of Jesus uh, and sort of compile all of this information. Now, what we know is that for uh, many, many years, maybe up to a couple of generations, all of these stories were sort of told in oral tradition. So it's from one person to another, and, and uh, maybe different pieces and parts of it were written down. But the first gospel, the gospel of Mark, is written in the mid-70s. So Jesus dies 33. It's not until the mid-70s that the actual gospel is compiled. One of the things we understand very clearly when we read the Bible is that the authors had this much material to work with and they had this much room to, to write it. So this much material, this much room, which means they had to make decisions about what was in and what was out, uh, what they, which stories they would use and which stories they wouldn't use, and they made these decisions based on their audience that they were talking to. If you were telling a story to an 80-year-old, and you were telling a story to an eight-year-old, you would maybe include different, uh, different language, different words, uh, different images um, to communicate the same story. The story's the same. What happened is the same. But you would use different ways to communicate that to two different generations or, or different age or different situations uh, of people. And so that's what's happening in the Gospels. Um, what we know is that there's multiple generations of manuscripts. So there was an original manuscript that the gospel writer of Mark wrote. We don't believe that we have that. Um, these manuscripts, of course, this is far before the printing press. So every manuscript is, is copied by hand. So someone is paid, a scribe is paid to go and to copy it by hand. Um, and um, we then what you what you have is sort of this family tree of of manuscripts. Um, we for none of the gospels have we found the uh, what we believe is the original manuscript. And there's a whole way that people study this through mistakes made and and whatnot, changes made in the manuscripts. We 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 don't get back to the beginning. So all of these manuscripts are hand copied. So let's say um, I I. Um, copy the original and you copy the original well chances are um if if i make a mistake in what i'm copying and i change a word or i skip a sentence or something i mean if you're hand copying something that the mistakes can be made 
then the person who copies mine, their manuscript is different than the original because what they have copied is my mistake into it. Now, so I copy something and I make some mistakes and you copy something and you make some mistakes, obviously fewer than what I would make, but you make some mistakes. So now the family of manuscripts that copies from yours is different than the family of manuscripts that copies from mine. So that's that's one of the ways in which these manuscripts sort of change through the years. The other way in, in which they change through the years is people not necessarily making mistakes, but people making editorial changes. Have you ever written something that, um, you know, you thought it was fine and you gave it to someone else, a, a coworker or supervisor or something, and they changed your words? They they wanted to, they thought that they could make it better. Um, you know, there there are times in which I preach a sermon and uh, there are people in the greeting line who want to uh, critique or, or uh, suggest that I ought to have changed something about what I said. Um, and in their mind, I could have said it better. Um, and, and I should have said it in, in this way. Well, that happens in the biblical writing. So I'm, I'm an educated, uh, religious um, worker, a scribe. Um, not only can I read and write, but I'm educated in the religious tradition. And I'm copying a manuscript. Well, it might occur to me, if they said it this way, it would be more understandable. Or if they said it this way, people might understand it. And so what happens is manuscript by manuscript, the text gets perfected a little bit by some of those scribes who are copying the manuscript. So they want it to be a little bit uh, better. And uh, so um, that that happens um, from uh, time to time in the manuscripts. And so it, it, essentially what I'm trying to say is as we get down the road of these multiple generations of manuscripts, they begin to look different from one another. They begin to, and, and for multiple reasons, they begin to look different from one another. Now we can't do a study um, honestly, of the Gospel of Mark without having this sort of groundwork, without having uh, this conversation, because this conversation is is uh, pertinent to um, the way that we understand the Gospel of Mark. We can't do a study of the Gospel of Mark justice without this kind of understanding. So open your Bible, go to uh, the Gospel of uh, Mark, Chapter 16, this is uh, the last chapter in the gospel. It's the shortest of the gospels, by the way. Um, and what you will see, so go to verse 16, I mean chapter 16, sorry. Go down to um, verse 8. At the end of verse 8, you might have a note there in your Bible. In my Bible, the note says the shorter ending of Mark. Then if you turn over, there's sort of this verse eight, kind of eight and a half almost. And then in my Bible, it, there's another note that says the longer ending of Mark. We're going to talk about this, the shorter ending and the longer ending. The What, what we believe is the most original ending, um, and again, we don't have the original uh, manuscript, the most original ending is the shorter ending of Mark. But then for good reason, um, future copiers of that manuscript and future religious leaders added some more material to make up the longer ending to sort of finish out the story. You ever get to the end of a movie and uh, the movie ends and you think, what, what, how, how could you end right there? You didn't, you, you didn't bring it full circle. You didn't, you, you, it, you didn't finish the story. You left something to my imagination. I wanted you to finish the story. You ever you ever feel like that? You read a book or you watch a movie? Well, that's the way some people felt when they were reading the Gospel of Mark, that they, you didn't finish it. You've got to have these pieces to finish the story. And so some future generations of folks uh, finish the story, essentially. But in our very technical study of this, what we can see is those manuscripts that we believe were the earlier manuscripts didn't have this longer finished ending. So um, that's sort of a long explanation about that. Um, sorry, but I wanted, wanted to um, set, the, uh, set the sort of tone for this study. We're going to um, now look at the shorter ending uh, today. In the next study, we'll look at those longer ending pieces. So the shorter ending. 
Mark chapter 16, uh, verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. I would point out again, just like Matthew, only women who were there, uh, Mary, Mary, Salome. In the Gospel of Matthew, is only the two Marys, but here they've been joined in the story uh, by Salome, who's believed to be the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Um, and uh, so another woman who sort of this disciple that cared for Jesus along the way as well. Uh, verse two, and very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. Now, notice again, difference from Matthew. In Matthew, they get there. There's an angel who's descending from heaven. There's some guards who are afraid and they become like dead men, remember, in Matthew. There's also an earthquake and it's the earthquake that rolls the, the stone back. Now, now, Mark doesn't have any of those components. That doesn't mean that they weren't there, that that didn't happen, that that's not how the stone got rolled back. It just means perhaps that Mark decided not to include those details because, again, they have this, this much content, but they only have this much room with which to write that content. And so something has to be left out. Perhaps that's what Mark left out. Um, verse 5, as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Now, in Matthew, there's the tomb is empty. In Mark, they look into the tomb and here is a young man dressed in white who's in the tomb. And Jesus is not. This young man is not Jesus. is not a younger version of Jesus. This is someone completely different and they are alarmed. The same response, right? In, in Matthew, the word was fear, but this is the, the same response. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, here is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and, and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid period, end of book. What, what a strange way to end the gospel. We're going to talk about this. Uh, that So they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Hard stop. So next session, we're going to talk about that hard stop, and we're going to talk about what was added into the longer ending of the Gospel of Mark. But what I want to finish this session with is, is a question, who is this young man? Who's the young man who's in the tomb, right? He's, he's not one of the, the 12 disciples or 11 now after Judas had betrayed Jesus. He's, they don't recognize him as one of them. It doesn't say he was an angel like it says in Matthew. Who is this young man what does it mean that he is dressed in white? I mean, they, they make this point that he's dressed in white. Well, one of, the reason, one of the ways that we do biblical study is when we have questions like this, we say, okay, where else in the Bible does it mention people like this? So, um, for example, in this story, someone who's dressed in white. Where are other references of people dressed in white in the biblical story? Um, well, in the New Testament, most of the references about people dressed in white are people are from the book of Revelations. So turn to the book of Revelation, the last book in uh, the Bible, chapter 3, verse 5. I'm sorry, verse 4. Yet you still have a few persons in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. If you conquer, you will be clothed like them in white robes, and I will not blot your name out of the book of life. I will confess your name before my Father and before his angels." Now, Revelation is a vision of the afterlife after the second coming of Jesus. What does it sound like? The, so these people who are dressed in white, 
um, that will be a sign of those who have um, remained faithful and who Jesus will speak on behalf of to the Father. That, in, in this Revelation passage, that's what it means to be dressed in white. That's how we will know that they are faith, the faithful at the end times are dressed in white. Now turn over to chapter 7, verse 13. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb, the, the uh, animal sacrifice, Jesus sacrificed his blood that our sins might be covered, that it's the faithful, again, in this Revelations passage, who are dressed in white. Consider that. So they, they see an unnamed person in the, the tomb who is dressed in white, which is a symbol of those who have overcome the great ordeal. They have come through the task. They have washed their, their robes. They have been resurrected. They have, survived, they have survived this life. They have been resurrected in the afterlife. Now, if you're resurrected, what does that mean? First must have happened. Well, in order to be resurrected, you must first die. So let's go back to Mark chapter uh, 14 this time. Mark chapter 14. Um, and uh, let's start at verse 43. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. Chap um, verse 50. All of them deserted him and fled. All of his followers, the women who had been following him, the disciples who he called... All of them at his arrest deserted him and fled. Now that is in all four of the Gospels. The next verses, um, the, the next two verses are only in the Gospel of Mark. A certain young man was following him. Now it just said all of them deserted and fled. A certain young man was still following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. Now, you might say, all right, uh, he deserted him as well. He was still following, but they caught the cloth. He, he ran off naked. Um, if you went to any writing in the Greco-Roman world, um, and, it, you know, Socrates, Plato, uh, Homer, the, the epic poems, uh, Iliad and Odyssey, all of that, all of that stuff is from the culture in which the Gospel of Mark is, is written and the culture in which uh, Peter and Paul and, and the first few generations of disciples are evangelizing. So they, that, that is the world in which they live. And if you read any of those epic poems, what you will see is that the, a term for death is to escape naked. You know, when we say someone died, we might say they went to sleep. Or they passed away, and if you if if you said you know they went someone went to eternal sleep or or they passed away, everyone in our culture would know. Oh, they that person that person died. Um, in the Greco-Roman culture, they they had this idea of a dualism between body and soul. And in death, what happened is that your soul escaped your body, and now your soul is naked, sort of in its original state. And so, in the Greco-Roman world, if you say the person escaped naked, everyone would know that person died. 
And that's the language that they use here. So every verse 50, everyone deserts. Verse 51, there's still one person following. That person is seized by the guards and that person escapes naked. Maybe it's that person who was killed. So consider this. Maybe the gospel writer Mark is telling a story within a story. That one story is this gospel story about the resurrection of Jesus. Another story is about the resurrection of the followers of Jesus. Resurrection of of people who truly follow. That this is not just a story about how Jesus gets resurrected, but this is a story about how you get resurrected. So consider During this story that what we see time and time again are the disciples and and other people who are following him, they betray him, they deny him, they desert him. And what we would be saying, what we say as we're writing this, right, as we're reading this, I mean, when we get to verse 50 and it says, all of them deserted him and fled, the faithfulness within us says, no, I would not have. I would have had the strength to stay. I would have stayed with him. Right? I wouldn't be like Peter and deny him three times. I wouldn't be like Judas and, and betray him. I wouldn't be like those others and, and desert him in his moment of need. I would have stuck with him. I would have stayed with him. Well, you know what? There's someone who did, verse 51, and that person doesn't have a name. Maybe that's so that you can place your name into that person. And that person dies escapes naked. And then just days later, what we discover is that there is a young man, just like verse 51, who is dressed in a white robe, the clothes of those who have been resurrected, who is also unnamed. Is Mark making a point here that that those who would stay with Jesus to the end that that's the way in which they get resurrection. And is Mark using this sort of literary tool to not name someone so that you would place yourself into that person's shoes and say, I would have stayed. I would have been faithful to the end. And for those who are faithful to the end, what they receive? Resurrection. It's a beautiful way, I think, of looking at the gospel. Here's the question that I think it ought to leave us with. And that is, what does it mean for us this Easter to live as resurrection people? If we've been faithful, we've held on to the end, and Jesus gives us new life again this Easter, what are you going to do with it? What difference is that going to make in your life? How are you going to use it, this new opportunity to make a difference in others' lives? I hope this has been helpful to you. God bless you. Take care of yourself. Take care of others. Know that God is taking care of us during these difficult times. God bless.